Hello everyone and welcome back to another True Crime Mysteries video. Thank you all for being here. Today we're discussing three heartbreaking fetal kidnapping cases. These baby snatcher kidnappers and murderers targeted vulnerable pregnant women, stole their babies, and attempted to pass them off as their own. Let's get into it. Number 1. Taylor Parker It was on October 9, 2020 when an officer witnessed a vehicle in Idabel, Oklahoma driving erratically. The officer pulled over the driver and as he approached the vehicle, he knew something was wrong. The woman was frantic, covered in blood, and stated she'd given birth on the side of the road and was rushing to the hospital because her baby wasn't breathing. The baby was very small and blue. As they waited for an ambulance, they tried to help the woman, noting that she herself was covered head to toe in blood, but the blood looked dry. But there wasn't much blood in the car. A placenta with a connected umbilical cord had fallen out of the woman's lap. At the hospital, the woman was identified as 29-year-old Taylor Parker who claimed she was overdue and gave birth by herself in her car. They estimated the baby based on size to be around seven months old, but Parker insisted that she was overdue and the baby was full term. Parker allowed them to do a physical exam of her and quickly discovered that she didn't have a cervix or a uterus. Her medical records showed she had cancer in 2014 and had undergone a full hysterectomy. There was no way that this woman had birthed this baby. Meanwhile, in New Boston, Texas, a grisly crime scene was discovered. Jessica Brooks got a text message from her son-in-law, who was at work, to stop over at their house. He said that he received a couple of strange text messages from his wife, Regan, and asked if they might stop by and check on his wife and three-year-old daughter. When Jessica arrived, she found blood everywhere. She called 911, and while on the phone with the dispatcher, discovered the three-year-old granddaughter was unharmed. 21-year-old Regan Hancock was declared deceased at the scene, she had been seven and a half months pregnant and first responders discovered that the fetus had been cut from her body in an ugly, botched delivery. Regan had been severely beaten with a hammer and stabbed over a hundred times with a scalpel that was found embedded in her throat. It was a horrific attack that had been extremely violent. Regan's daughter had witnessed the entire attack. An Amber Alert was placed and Oklahoma law enforcement quickly connected Regan's murder with Taylor Parker's bizarre claims. A DNA test was taken and positively identified Regan Hancock as the mother. The baby suffered severe brain damage due to lack of oxygen and ultimately died the next day. Regan and her husband had named the baby Braxlyn Sage. Parker was arrested and during a police interview stated that she was a longtime friend with Regan, which wasn't exactly true. Parker had been Regan's wedding photographer and the two were friends on Facebook. Parker claimed that she went over to see Regan that morning and the women got into a physical altercation and Regan became so injured that she asked Parker to remove the baby to save it. A claim that was so outlandish and disproved by medical experts who maintained that Regan was deceased when the baby was removed from her body. The subsequent investigation unraveled a massive web of lies. Parker's boyfriend believed that she was nine months pregnant, though Parker's family knew that she'd been lying about the pregnancy the entire time, as they knew that she'd had cervical cancer years before. According to those who knew the couple, they had been on the verge of breaking up when Parker miraculously became pregnant. But as the months went on, Parker apparently started becoming more desperate. Many assumed the pregnancy was going to end like so many fake pregnancies with a spontaneous miscarriage. They had no idea Parker would resort to murder to keep her relationship going. In the weeks before Regan was murdered, Parker had shown up to her birthing center she'd been to before and requested her medical records from her first two births and then staff watched as she sat on a bench near the parking lot. It had later been determined that she had been recording the license plates of expecting mothers that she watched go in and out of the clinic, looking for a woman to attack. Detectives seized her computer and noted that in the days and hours before Regan's murder, Parker had spent hours researching how to perform home births, birth protocols, and cesarean sections. Through her devices, it was determined that Parker had spent about two weeks planning Regan's murder. Taylor Parker was charged with the murder of Regan as well as Braxlin, in addition to charges of kidnapping. Parker pleaded not guilty and was held in custody until her trial in September 2022, when the jury ultimately found her guilty. She is now undergoing sentencing, where the prosecution is requesting the death penalty. I'm outside Reagan's home, which is where it all happened last week. And over the weekend, people actually started building a memorial for her with flowers and stuffed animals outside of her house. Never quit smiling, never quit trying and moving on and tackling the next hurdle. The most beautiful person 
her spirit, her her personality, everything about her was beautiful. A piece of us is gone now. Emily Simmons says her sister Reagan is the glue that keeps her family together. She always held us close and she's holding us closer now. The 21 year old was known as wife to Homer Hancock and mom to three year old Kenley Grace. And she was also expecting another baby girl who she'd named Braxlyn Sage. She became a mother early, um, but after she had Kenley, she went on to get her high school diploma and she was aspiring to uh, eventually get in. She was going to start taking classes again in the spring um, and she wanted to go into nursing eventually. But the community is lifting this family up. She loved unity. She did not. She did not like any discord in any relationship. She didn't like confrontations. She wanted unity and this would make her so proud. For now, the family is leaning on their faith. Just prayers. All we can ask for is prayers. Everywhere I look, I see her. Number two, Lisa Montgomery. Lisa Montgomery made international headlines when she was found holding a newborn baby that had been cut out of the mother that had died in a vicious murder. Due to the fact that she had crossed state lines, she was charged with the death penalty for murder and kidnapping. Her victim, Bobby Jo Stinnett, was left to bleed out on the living room floor. In 2004, Lisa Montgomery told her second husband, children, and immediate family members that she was pregnant and would be due around Christmas time. Lisa had been known to do this periodically. Her sister stated that she frequently lied about pregnancies and had actually undergone surgery to get her tubes tied after a traumatic pregnancy in her early 20s. Lisa even took an ultrasound image she found online and edited it to look like it had her name on it. Her new husband thought that they'd been trying to conceive for years. She didn't tell her husband that she couldn't have more children. She had been caught on several occasions faking a pregnancy. Those around her believed that she was a pathological liar. Friends and family often witnessed her telling outright lies to basically anyone she came in contact with, even lying about small, insignificant things. She and her husband were rat terrier breeders. Lisa used a fake name in an online forum for rat terrier enthusiasts called Ratter Chatter, under the name Darlene Fisher. She posted that she wanted to purchase a puppy. A man in the chat room, Jason Dawson, connected her to a friend and fellow rat terrier breeder named Bobby Justinette. He knew that one of her dogs had just had a litter of puppies and suggested a particular puppy that had red fur on December 15th. He passed on Bobby Joe's email address and phone number. At 23, Bobby Jo Stinnett had her whole life ahead of her. She was newly married, eight months pregnant, and ran a successful dog breeding business with her husband. She and her husband, Jeb Stinnett, were passionate about rat terriers and had actually met Lisa Montgomery and her husband at several dog shows. On the morning of December 16, 2004, Bobby was home alone. She was waiting to meet a woman interested in one of her puppies. They had only communicated via email, but she felt safe inviting the woman into her home. The woman calling herself Darlene had also said that she was pregnant and they were due around the same time. When there was a knock at the door, Bobby allowed the woman into her home. Then she made tea and they briefly chatted for a bit. But when Bobby turned around to go into the kitchen, Darlene pulled a neon pink rope from a baggy sweater and wrapped it around Bobby's neck. When Bobby passed out and fell to the ground, Lisa Montgomery cut open her abdomen. At some point during the incision, Bobby regained consciousness. There had been blood on the bottom of her feet so much blood that it had pooled up and over her toes. Lisa moved behind her head and used a rope and pulled while Bobby was lying on the ground until Bobby again lost consciousness. Approximately an hour after the attack, Bobby's mother, Becky Harper, came by the house. She discovered Bobby on the floor, called 911, and told the operator that it looked like her stomach had exploded. First responders tried to revive Bobby, but their efforts were unsuccessful. She had lost too much blood. It was quickly discovered that the baby was no longer in the home, and it was noted that Bobby's umbilical cord had been cut. An Amber Alert was issued that day to enlist the public's help. When Kevin Montgomery, Lisa Montgomery's husband, was on the stand in her trial, he told the court that he'd heard the Amber Alert but didn't connect it to the baby his wife had come home with. He told the court his wife had told him that she'd been out shopping in Topeka on December 16, 2004, when she'd gone into labor and delivered the baby at a birth and growth center in Topeka. He said that he'd been led to believe it was his first child, and he was excited. They spent most of December 17th showing off the baby at a cafe, a bank, and his parents' home. They had named the baby Abigail. Police knocked on their door on the evening of December 17th. 
police had used computer forensics to track down Lisa Montgomery using her IP address and communications with Bobby. They were also able to match her vehicle to a vehicle that neighbors had stated seeing near Bobby's house. Further investigation revealed that Lisa had researched for weeks on how to perform C-sections, where to cut, and how to remove a baby and cut the umbilical cord. The baby was healthy despite her violent entrance into the world. She was reunited with her father and was named Victoria Jostinet. Police did do a DNA check just to validate the child was with their rightful parent. In her trial, the prosecutors argued that Montgomery's ex-husband knew that she was lying about her pregnancy and feared he would expose her. At the time, he sought custody of two of their four children, and she was convinced he would use it against her in court. Her defense argued that she had suffered a miscarriage and had taken the baby in a mental break, but given her level of preparedness and that Lisa had known she was not able to conceive, the jury didn't buy this defense. The jury convicted Montgomery of kidnapping, resulting in death, and four days later, she was sentenced to capital punishment. She was incarcerated at the Federal Medical Center in Fort Worth, Texas. She remained there until her execution date. While there, she underwent several evaluations where experts determined that she had bipolar disorder and PTSD and was often in a disassociated reality. They also determined that she had permanent brain damage from physical abuse she experienced as a child. Her legal team had made several appeals, but all appeals were dismissed. Her sentence was carried out on December 13th, 2021. Number three, Clarissa Figueroa. It was on April 23rd, 2019, when 19-year-old Marlon Ochoa Lopez was reported missing in Chicago, Illinois. Marlon had been due to pick up her three-year-old son from daycare, but never arrived. When she couldn't be reached anywhere, her family reported her missing. Further concern was that this was highly unusual behavior for Marlon, and she was nine months pregnant. Her black Honda Civic was also missing, and the initial concern was that she'd gotten into an accident, but there weren't any traffic incidents, hospital records, or anything to locate the mother. For weeks, the family searched for Marlon and had no idea what had happened to her. The same day that Marlon went missing, Clarissa Figueroa called 911. The 46-year-old claimed to have given birth at home and needed an ambulance because the baby wasn't breathing. The two were rushed to the hospital where the newborn was treated. However, a lack of oxygen had likely caused severe brain damage. Initially, the hospital's priority was stabilizing and treating the infant, but in the days following their arrival, doctors started noticing things with Figueroa that didn't seem to match her story. She didn't show any signs of having just given birth. Medical records also showed that she'd had her tubes tied. However, little was done for days. The hospital eventually did do a DNA test and determined that Figueroa was not related to the infant. On May 7th, law enforcement was notified of a potential kidnapping that linked them to Marlon's disappearance. On May 14th, law enforcement issued a search warrant for Figueroa's home, 21 days from Marlon's disappearance. While at the home, investigators found blood evidence, burned clothing, and digital evidence connecting Figueroa to Marlon. The two were both in a Facebook group called Help a Sister Out. Marlon had posted requesting baby items she needed. Figueroa had responded, claiming that she had items she didn't need, which included baby clothes. A second search of the home located Marlon's body, which was found in a garbage bin on the property, as well as her vehicle, which had multiple parking tickets on it. Clarissa Figueroa was arrested and confessed. Also arrested was her 24-year-old daughter, Desiree Figueroa, and her boyfriend, 40-year-old Petra Bobak. It had been Clarissa who had planned the abduction for months. Desiree had distracted Marlene, and Clarissa had strangled her with a cord. The two women then surgically removed the infant and attempted to cover the crime scene before calling 911. After weeks in the hospital, the baby boy, later named Giovanni JDL, was reunited with his family but he remained on life support for weeks and ultimately died due to extensive brain damage. Marlon's husband, Giovanni Lopez, lost his wife and newborn. Heavy criticism fell in the hospital due to the slow response of involving law enforcement. Weeks had gone by before baby Giovanni was removed from Figueroa's custody. What was worse was that the hospital billed the Lopez family $300,000 for medical expenses with the baby's name being listed as Figueroa Boy. The Lopez family said that they had been devastated and further traumatized by the incident. 
A lawyer for the family stated that they had been told by the hospital that the costs had been waived, and the hospital later confirmed that the invoice had been sent by mistake. However, the Lopez family described the situation as atrocious and called out the hospital for its lack of humanity towards a grieving family. Clarissa and Desiree Figueroa were charged with murder in the first degree, aggravated kidnapping, aggravated battery of a child, and dismembering a body. They both pleaded not guilty and are being held in custody while they await further court dates. Bobak was charged with concealing a homicidal death and obstruction of justice. He has also pleaded not guilty and remains in custody. A trial date has yet to be set at the time of recording. Marlon's family is committed to continuing to attend every court proceeding and keeping Marlon and Giovanni's horrific murder in the public eye to ensure there's justice for them. They are monsters. It's just too much already. It's just too much. Scared to show their faces or reveal their names, the adult twin daughters of Clarissa Figueroa describe the horror after learning that their mother and half-sister Desiree allegedly murdered a woman, took her baby, and tried to pass it off as her brother. My mom goes, do you want to see your baby brother? That was April 24th, the day after they say mom Clarissa called to say she had a baby. The twins say they hadn't seen their mom in nearly a year, but they did keep in contact with her over the phone. So you walked, you and, walked, you yeah. moved around the labor and delivery. Yeah, care, I was in the, problems. yeah, well, any problems. I just went in her room. The room she's referring to, labor and delivery at Advocate Christ. The sister says her mom stayed there for three days, accompanied by her boyfriend, Peter Bobek, who they confirm is seen in these pictures. One sister says she visited her mom two days later on April 26. I seen the baby and I touched the baby and I didn't think of anything about like it wasn't my brother because my mom said it was my brother. Both women say they grew up in an unstable home and were neglected by their mother. I was a, a teen mom at the age of 16. I lived on my own since then. Tonight, both sisters admit they had doubts. They should have checked my mom. They should have made sure that the baby was her mom. Like, if they knew that her tooth were tied, why didn't you double check? Like, why didn't you check if that was her baby? The twins say they will not be able to forgive their mother and sister and sent a message to the Ochoa family. I want to tell Marlene's family that I'm so sorry for everything that they're going through. Well, that is it for this video. As always, thank you so much for watching. If you like this content and what I do over here, please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss my next upload. As always, if you can give this video a like if you enjoyed the content, that would be much appreciated as it helps the channel to grow. We also have channel membership or Patreon if you want to get more behind the scenes content or exclusive content or just to support the channel. In the description box of this video, you will also find links to all my socials to connect with me as well as other goodies. But that is it for me. Thank you so much for being here. I will see you all in the next one. Bye for now.